We're back once again in the study of spiritual gifts. We move to session 28 and we give a warm welcome in Christ to all of you watching by DVD and those of you in the classroom. The last time we studied the spiritual gift of encouragement. We said it's a private gift. It's a gift where one person with the gift of encouragement comes alongside another believer who is in danger of wandering away off the path. They spend time with them, they show love to them, they build a relationship, they increase the trust level, but at some point they confront the person about returning to Christ. It is a gift that ensures that people stay true to Christ. God often uses those people as his agent through the power of the Spirit to draw people back to him. In this session, we're going to look at the gift of hospitality, and it is another one of those gifts associated with the heart. Let's start by looking at a biblical character who only makes an appearance once in Scripture. Uh, it's a very, uh, she's a very interesting woman. Her name is Lydia. And if you would open your Bibles to Acts 16, 13 to 15, We will look at the story of Lydia. Lydia is a, a believer in Christ, and she is someone who loves Christ with all her heart. And she definitely has the gift of hospitality. We're looking at verse 13, we'll go to verse 15. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who were gathered there. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatria, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message, and when she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited them into her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house, and she persuaded us. When we look back at the beginning verse, it says, on the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river. I want to mention this term, we. The book of Acts, like the Gospel of Luke, was written by Luke, a physician. All of Luke's writings are very detailed because Luke was a doctor and he was trained to be able to pick up a lot of details. So they're very rich in terms of uh, describing a scene, helping us to understand exactly what's taking place. And whenever Luke was actually with Paul, he uses the word we because he's there. So Luke was there, he's describing what's taking place. You will see other times where he says they went. Luke was not there. So he's, again, very detailed, very true, and very honest to the experience. Sometimes he's saying, I was there. I'm an eyewitness to this. Other times he's saying, I didn't see this, but Paul told me about it. It's a very important distinction and one that will perhaps help you understand a little more about when something is really being described that was first-hand knowledge rather than second-hand knowledge. And then notice that it was the women that were gathered down the, by the river. After I explain about Lydia, I want to talk about the role of women in the church just briefly. And Lydia was a dealer in purple cloth. Purple is the color of royalty. And it was a very difficult dye to make which may in fact be part of the reason why it was associated with royalty. Even today in many churches where it is important for them to use the colors of whatever season it is, when it comes to Easter, when it comes to Christmas and celebrations, they use purple throughout the church because it's the sign of royalty, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Other times they use other colors associated with those seasons. And she was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message to be baptized. 
and she was baptized, and then she said, come to my house, You'll stay with me. And she persuaded them to stay with Paul. This is the gift of hospitality, where you invite people, sometimes people you hardly know, to come and have a meal with you, perhaps even stay overnight with you and lodge at your home. It is a gift that is not associated with making your home beautiful, where there's no clothes or dirt or junk hanging around and it just it looks immaculate. Uh, the table is set just so. The decorations are just nice. I know that's very important to some women. And it's a very wonderful thing that I appreciate when I go to people's home. That's not the gift of hospitality. I've gone to many people's home with the gift of hospitality where it's messy, where there's clothes, every, the kids' toys are laying out, and yet I feel comfortable. I feel at home. I feel safe to talk about what's really going on in my life. And the conversations turn to Jesus. That's the gift of hospitality. Now, for just a moment, I want to talk about the women's role in the church, first in New Testament times. You may notice that this is the first time we've mentioned any woman in any of our discussions on spiritual gifts. And why is that? In New Testament times, women played a very subservient role. Their role was to take care of the children and to take care of the house and to prepare their meals. They were not the ones who were out ministering. If they ministered at all, they ministered to other women. And so who was writing the Bible? Mostly, it was men. I mean, there are, there's the book of Ruth. There's the book of Esther. We're not sure if it was written by those two individuals, but there is no other book associated with a woman. So in many ways, the New Testament church is what we would call it today, sextus. But that was the times. And of course, in many countries, the times are changing. Women are playing a much more important role in our society. Men are sharing much more of the responsibilities with inside the home. And that's certainly true in my country of the United States of America. But I'm very aware that there are some of you who are watching by DVD or some of you in countries around the world where that is not the case. That women still in your culture have a different role to play. And it's one that's very similar to New Testament times. I am making no judgments on what your culture believes and how women are treated in your culture. From my perspective, if women are treated with dignity and with respect, then whatever role your culture assigns to women is a matter for you to decide in your culture. It is not a matter for me to impose what I believe is right on you. However, it is important for me to share what my beliefs are concerning women in the church. First of all, I believe God has given any of the spiritual gifts to women. Women have the gift of leadership. Women have the gift of teaching. Women can stand up and preach. The question in many churches is, should that teaching, should that leadership be confined to a role with only women? Or is it a situation where all gifts could be used no matter if it's men or women in the church. My personal belief is that women comprise over half of the population of the world. In the church, women comprise many, many more percentages. If you go to most churches, there are far more women in the church than there are men. And I believe that God says that he created man and woman. And that man and woman both have the responsibility to use their gifts in the entire church body. In my church, women do teach from the pulpit where men are present. That is the belief of our church. And I have benefited greatly 
from the teachings of women who have brought a message to the 7,200 people who attend my church. I have welcomed their message. I have learned from it. I have applied it to my life. But that's my church. Your church may believe something differently. And much like we've said with the gift of interpretation and tongues and miracles and healing, let us not be divided by our beliefs regarding the role of women in the church. Let each congregation choose for itself what they believe. Some people look at what Paul has written and wholeheartedly believe that a woman should not teach a man, meaning in church. The belief of our church is that it is a cultural matter, that in Paul's culture, that was not done. In other cultures, that it may be appropriate. So please decide among your own body of Christ in the local congregation which you believe. However, in all situations, women should be treated with the respect and the dignity that they deserve as one who has been made by their Creator and who in the creation story came from the rib of man. Not meaning that because she was made second, she's less important. Meaning that she came along the side of men to be his helpmate. As man provides leadership in the home, it must be loving leadership, not dictatorial leadership. Not, woman, this is what you're going to do. I've decided. Right before Paul talks about the role of men, he talks about that you must together serve one another. And then he gives a very high standard, gentlemen, for the role of the husband. He says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. I would say that's a pretty high standard. He says, love your wife in the same way that Christ loved the church. And he even died for it. Men, that's a very high standard. Women should be held in an exalted role and should be treated as an equal partner in the relationship. And I believe that that's true no matter what culture we may come from. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TVS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, please visit tvsseminary.com. Let's talk about this gift of hospitality. Will you turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 4? Now you will remember that I said there are four main passages that, have talk, that talk about spiritual gifts. One is Romans 12, then 1 Corinthians 12, then Ephesians 4, and then finally 1 Peter 4. There are two chapters we have not talked about yet. We have not talked about Ephesians chapter 4, which we will, will in a later session. And now, for the first and the only time, we'll refer to 1 Peter chapter 4. And if you'll come down to verse 8, we'll learn a little bit about the gift of hospitality. Paul, uh, Peter begins to write, Above all, above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. There are three verses that are associated with hospitality. Verses 8, 9, and 10. And each of those presents an important point about hospitality in association with hospitality. First of all, in verse 8, it talks about love each other deeply. Love is always, always the motivation for using our spiritual gifts. It should never be used in pride. It should never be used to puff ourselves up. It should not be used to control other people. The right motivation for the spiritual gift is, I love the person I'm serving. Love is the motivation for all spiritual gift. In 9, 
It talks about hospitality, but notice it says, without grumbling. Don't complain because uh, we've got to have people over. They had us over at their house for dinner. Now we should have them over to our house. Or uh, they're going to be staying at our house. I just wanted a quiet night alone at home. This is grumbling, and it's not what the gift is all about. And then the important part is in verse 10. Each one should use whatever gift he has received. Why would Paul talk about hospitality and then suddenly change and talk about gift if hospitality were not a gift? I mean, it, it's flowing in his mind. He's talking about love and then he's talking about hospitality without grumbling and then he says, use your gift. You see, there are people who much like the gift of uh, tongues and interpretation, healing, and um, intercession and miracles. They say, these are not gifts. Well, I have told you that unless you see the word charisma there, it's not a gift. This word gift, God's grace in its various forms, those two phrases are associated with charisma and that word is used here. So to those who say this is not a gift, I mean, notice that Paul's not going to shift his thinking in mid-sentence. Okay, I was talking about hospitality. All right, let me shift. Now I'll talk about gifts. It's flowing in his mind, so he is associating it with hospitality. And then the word charisma appears linked to hospitality. Hospitality is a gift. Will you please turn in your Bible a few uh, books back to Hebrews chapter 13. And in Hebrews 13, we're just going to look at one little tiny verse that's really interesting. It presents a view that some people have experienced and others have not, but they might not be aware that they have. And it has to do with hospitality. In verse 13, uh, chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, keep on loving each other as brothers. Notice that love is there again love. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing, uh, so doing, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Isn't that a remarkable thing? If you've had people stay in your house, it's possible that they were angels. I have never had this happen to me. In fact, I don't know anyone that it's happened to, but I know that it's true and that it may have happened to you. And for many of us, we may not even be aware because it says, without knowing it. There may come a time when we're in heaven and we recognize that the people that we allowed to come to our house and have, have a meal or stay overnight, that in fact, we were entertaining an angel and we didn't even know it. I think that's a remarkable little part to Scripture that's uh, interesting. Well, turn back to 1 Peter 4, because we're going to look at the uh, Greek words associated with hospitality. First of all, that gift is not listed in 1 Corinthians 12 or in Ephesians 4, but it is linked here, and it is a gift. And in verse 9, where the word hospitality is used. The Greek term is philaprutuo. philaprutuo. It is G5382. And in the Greek, it means being generous to guess. And the root word, the word from which hospitality comes from in the Greek, is kazenas, spelled X-E-N-O-S, Kazenas, G3581, and it means one who receives and entertains others hospitably. It means being a host to a foreigner, a stranger, or an alien for lodging. Very, very interesting idea. It's both the idea of being generous to whomever is in your home, but more so, it is offering hospitality to strangers. It's to all believers 
but in particular, it's to strangers. Now, this gift is not associated with evangelism. This is not, I'm going to have these people in my home, and then I'm going to try to win them to Christ. This is associated with the body of Christ, of ministering within the body, having people over for a meal, and being hospitable, being generous to them, creating an environment that's very welcoming. But it's also missionaries are traveling through your area and they have no place to stay. And you say, they can stay at my house. Not because you feel obligated, I've got to do it, but because you want to do it. It's something that is a joy for you to have in your home. The definition that we're going to use for hospitality is to welcome believers, especially strangers, for food or lodging. To welcome believers, especially strangers, for food or lodging. And its purpose is to create an environment that promotes fellowship. Think how rich of an experience it is for you, or perhaps if you have children, to have a missionary from a foreign country staying in your home sharing about their experiences out on the mission field. There's fellowship there. And more so, those missionaries hear about your experiences in the church. There's a iron sharpening iron back and forth as we sit together and we talk perhaps over a meal. The role of this gift, once again, is caring for the church. Have you noticed how many of the roles are caring for the church? Because that's what the body of Christ does. We care for each other. When one is, has something good happen, we all rejoice. When some has something bad happen, we all cry. We all mourn. We are the body of Christ, each one of us. Now here's what commentators say about it. David Gusick says, It's to open homes to others and to do it cheerfully. I want to emphasize that last part. It's cheerfully. Matthew Henry says, Offering free and kind entertainment to strangers and travelers to build relationships among believers. And then Ministry Tools, which is an interest, internet site. Again, it's imintools.com. It says, and I like this one, to warmly welcome people, even strangers, into your home as a means of serving those in need with food and lodging. The visual aid I'd like you to use, think of a fireplace. Fireplace is warm and it's comfortable. Those of you in very warm climates, you probably don't need one. But those of us who are in very cold climates, there is nothing like a fireplace with the wood crackling and, and the fire different colors. It just makes you feel good. And imagine a rocking chair right next to it. And there's a blanket there that just keeps you warm. And, and you just feel comfortable. You feel safe. In fact, the times that I've done that, I usually fall asleep because I feel so comfortable, so safe. That's what people do when they're uh, have this gift. They make people feel welcomed, they make them feel safe, and they make them feel valued, that you're important. Would you please turn to one other passage, way in the front of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 18. And we'll have a biblical example of a Bible character showing hospitality. In this case, the patriarch, Abraham. And Abraham is sitting there one day under the trees at Marm, and some strangers come by. Let's pick it up in verse 1. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Marm while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby, and when he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them, and bowed low to the ground. He said, If I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass by your servant. Let a 
little water be brought, and then you may wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get something to eat so you can be refreshed, and then go on your way now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered. Do as you say. So Abraham hurried into his tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, get three sayas of flour and knead it and bake some bread. And then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to a ser servant who hurried to prepare it. And then he brought some curds and milk and calf that had been prepared and set these before them. And while they ate, he stood near them under a tree. Now in the Near East, in the Middle East, we call now, it has long been a custom that if there are travelers, you must show them hospitality. But this goes above and beyond. He, his wife bakes bread rather than just have them use what's there. He has, goes out and takes one of his own cattle and he has it slaughtered, butchered, prepared. He's gone over and above. This is the gift of hospitality. And then he puts them under the shade of a tree so that they feel comfortable. And this is a situation where Abraham doesn't know it, but he's entertained angels. He knows it in the next sentences because this is where he warns Abraham, if you have anybody living in Sodom and Gomorrah, get them out of there. And so he does. I have a personal example, and it's one of a friend of mine named Scott. And I use his as an illustration because he's a man. And often we associate hospitality that, ah, it's only a gift for women. It's not a gift for the guys. Well, Scott is married to a woman, Elizabeth, who has the gift of leadership. Scott does not. He has the gift of hospitality. He loves to have people over. He loves to barbecue for them, set them down at his table. It's not like they've gone out of the way to straighten the house. He's got three young kids. There's toys everywhere and clothes scattered around, but you just feel good being at their house. It's the gift of hospitality. I have some questions for you. Has God worked through your life to, number one, provide food or shelter to people you don't know or you don't know well? Number two, has God worked through you to invite believers into your home and do so joyfully and frequently? for a meal or for lodging? And three, has God worked through you to create an environment in your home where people love to come there because they feel welcomed, valued, and safe? One final point. Maybe you've never done these things, but as you heard those questions, if you felt a little tug of your heart that said, I'd love to be able to do that. Maybe right now you're not in a situation where you have your own home, but you might one day. Would you love to have people over? Have them come to your house for dinner and just talk? Have them stay at your house for lodging? If so, you may very well have the gift of hospitality. So would you please join us next time when we continue on our journey of spiritual gifts, we'll look at the gift of mercy. <music>